side. <laughs> okay, welcome everyone. Welcome. Today we have some very special guests here. Uh, we're on our second installment of uh, Zoom Q&As for the New Jersey Film Festival. We did them for the fall 2020 version and they were we did six of them they were a real success and so we're back for the spring 2021 new jersey film festival to do a series of q a's with the filmmakers who are going to be showing their films at our festival normally we would have many of them there to take questions and answers from our audience but unfortunately we don't have that flexibility this go around but we do have the fact that many of the filmmakers that are too far away normally to come and do them in person are now able to do it this way. So today we have three wonderful guests and the films that we're going to be focusing on today, well, it's actually one film. It started out as a series of short films, but uh, it's turned out into a, a wonderful feature. And we're going to be showing Joey Skaggs, Satire and Art Activism, 1960s to the Present and Beyond by Judy. Oh, Judy, I forgot to ask how do you pronounce your last name? Drozd. 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 And then Joey Skaggs, of course, the subject of the film, they co-produced a series of oral histories and they're presented four of them that they put together as a kind of feature. And then we have Sarah Levitt, who's an acclaimed filmmaker, and she's going to be uh, asking questions as well. Sarah's film, Sound and Chaos, was a Best Documentary Prize winner. How long ago, Sarah? Five years ago? Well, like 2014 or 2015? Yeah, yeah, so about five, six years ago. And uh, I asked her to come and be part of our Q&A because, partially because, thanks to Sarah, Icarus Films, where she also works, um, is one of our sponsors and they're giving out prizes, uh, streaming prizes to Ovid, which is their online platform. So lots of reasons to have everybody here, but I wanted to say welcome to everyone. Um, Joey Skaggs' uh, Oral Histories will be playing on February 12th, which is a Friday. And the way that the film festival is working is of course, it's going to be virtual again this spring. And instead of having a screening only at one time, films will be available for 24 hours to begin to view. And then once you start watching it, you will have 24 hours to complete it. So you're a late night person and you wanna watch this wonderful uh, film at one o'clock in the morning on the 12th. You can do so the minute you start watching it, you have 24 hours to finish it. If you decide to start watching it at 11.45 that evening, you have till Saturday at 11.45 to finish it. So if you'd like to get information and wanna see the lineup, before we start our Q&A, you can go to our website, which is njfilmfest.com. And once you get there, you click on the schedule page for the spring 2021 New Jersey Film Festival. And then you click on the link for our Eventive website. We are using Eventive um, to stream the films. They do a wonderful job streaming movies. And we used them last semester. They were excellent. We had no technical problems. So we're back with them again, and you can see all of the films that we're showing. We're showing over 40 films from January 30th through February 21st uh, on select Friday, Saturday, and Sundays. So anyway, welcome everybody. I, I guess I'll start the questions and then hopefully Sarah, you'll jump in too. But how did you guys decide to go and create these oral histories about Joey's career? Uh, I know there's a wonderful documentary that was made about you guys that also won a Best Documentary Prize uh, back in 2017 called Art of the Prank. Um, why, why do these oral histories to kind of uh, supplement that film or? Um, I'll, I'll back up a little bit. We, Joey has this extraordinary archive of materials that he's collected over 50 plus years of doing the work he's doing. And he's come to this point where he's really interested in finding a permanent home for the archive. Mm -hmm. So about a year and a half ago, we went to Vienna, Austria, because the NYU Orphan Film Symposium, which happens every year, was happening in Austria, and it was in conjunction with the Austrian Film Museum. 
So we went there because it's all about film archiving and we thought, well, maybe we'll meet some people that can lead us to other people that can. Anyway, we met somebody by the name of Howard Besser, who's a professor at NYU. So we went to Vienna so that we could get back to <laughs> NYU. Anyway, he's, he's the, one of the people that originated the department at NYU, which is the Moving Image Archiving and Preservation Department within the Tisch School of the Arts. And he, uh, we met him and he was very familiar with Joey's work and he loved it and we created a relationship and um, he, he actually organized for us to meet with the Fales Library at NYU and then organized to have a student, a master's student as an intern for us this past summer. First Howard came before COVID, he came down and he literally measured linear feet <laughs> just to, that's what they do with archives, you know, in order to figure out what you've gotten. How you can handle it can you still see us because yes we've yes lost you i think we lost sarah can you still see me i do yes okay yeah. cool i okay. think sarah will have right. to kind of <laughs> reboot and we'll get sarah in a few minutes hopefully she'll come back on okay. uh, in a second i'm sorry the long story short is that we were working with an intern to create a collection assessment for the archive and as part of that, Joey suggested that maybe we should be doing oral histories because we have all this material. Mm -hmm. And um, so we thought, okay, well, let's do it. We'll do tests with this intern and uh, whose name is David Grease. And we, we did the first two films we did as tests. And then we thought this is really something special for us anyway, to be able to put this material together and actually see a cohesive story with, with everything intact so we began shooting and we barely stopped i mean we've shot many 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 stories i've edited four of them and we called you to see you know if you were interested in taking a look at them and then the rest is history yeah i mean well i i i love everything that joey's done i think that it, as a fellow artist it's just wonderful to see um him challenge the mainstream and to uh, make us rethink our situation on this planet and what we've been doing. And I think the absurdity of life, I think, comes through in a lot of the pranks and the performances that Joey's been able to do. And then to see them, I, I, I mean, there's 40, 60 of these things you said already that you've done? Well, we've shot a, a, more than 40, that maybe 46 or 47 stories, but have I've only edited four so far, and, and that's just, there's more to do even after that. Um, um, some of them will get grouped together to single pieces, but uh, there's a lot, a lot of material. There's hundreds of hours of, of documentation. Yeah. We figured, you know, it would be a great way to introduce people to Joey's work because it's so visceral. I mean, you, when you see it, you really understand a whole lot more, I think, than when you just read about it. Well, how would it compare to Art of the Prank? I mean, do you feel as if you would have more control now doing it this way versus working with somebody else who's who's not part of the family? Or well, also with different agenda, you know, different agenda, different objectives. I mean, Art of the Prank was really kind of Joey Skaggs 101. It's kind of an introduction to yeah. the work and there was no way within an hour and a half. Andrea Marini did a wonderful job did an amazing creating job. Art of the Prank. Yeah, yeah, he's a really nice it guy his too. film, it was Yes, it was it was his film yeah that's that's kind of what i felt because as i was as i was watching it i felt as if i was familiar with some of the stories but like all the background stuff i don't remember seeing you know your family history uh where you were brought up i don't think that's really it possibly <laughs> say it again it possibly it was such a you couldn't possibly there's such a vast volume of material for him to choose from and he wanted to tell a story with a current narrative. So I created the hoax within a hoax of doing a fictitious documentary. So he was able to follow me around watching how I put it together, which was instructive and, and a wonderful aspect to his film. But he couldn't possibly include, nor would he even make the associations of all the nuances uh, within my archive. Yeah. Meaning that he didn't know who, Al Roker really was, or Barbara <laughs> Walters, or right. you know, he didn't. He doesn't know, he have doesn't that. Know these so they didn't. They didn't make the inclusion. Right. Right. Yeah, I think Sa I'm so, Sarah's so getting. I'm, 
Sarah's coming back on. Sorry, I didn't mean to inter interrupt you. But it's, you know, I grew up in New York. Uh, I was unfortunately living on Staten Island for a while, <laughs> which was, we always went to New York for any of the action. Hi, Sarah. And so uh, it, the, the, the great thing is I knew all the people that you pranked on, you know, uh, Good Morning America or on Channel 7, Eyewitness News. I knew all those people because I grew up with them. So right. I think- that's oh, sorry. I was really excited to see Roz Abrams. I was just like, oh my God, I remember Roz Abrams. Like, it's <laughs> right. just it's like, <laughs> memory. Sarah, you grew up in Edison? Is that where you grew up? Yeah. So yeah. she's uh, from this part, same part of the world. So yeah. anyway, Sarah, you yeah. asked questions. Oh, so I, <laughs> I my, my internet died. So um, I missed, I missed the last couple of minutes, but like what, what, what? I mean, I, I don't know. I I should have written down a list of questions, but how? I mean, no. Let me let me keep thinking a little bit. Sorry. No worries. No worries. All we all we started to do was, you see, the the film that they're doing is now part of an archival um, uh, um, preservation um, um, project that they initiated after meeting uh, a faculty member from NYU at a conference in Austria, it just so happens that way. And yeah. now I had asked them why make these oral histories vis-a-vis -vis the previous film. And we talked about, you know, uh, that it's somebody else's film. One is also a primer, almost a 101 on Joey's career. And now they're working on these oral histories that last anywhere from five to 20 minutes and there's 40 plus, and we've, we've just got the tip of the iceberg, the four that have been edited and, uh, and completed. So I guess there's going to be another round of these that you can send us in the future. Um, and that, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, th years. I think home video would be great for this too. That way you would have, you know, a box set of Joey pranks. Um, well, that's what's interesting to us also is that this is a, a, a way of looking at a film that is nonlinear. You don't have to go sequentially from beginning, middle to the end. You can go anywhere you want. You can go to, to a year, to a certain prank, to a theme. Uh, so it's, it's opening up a whole new way of, of watching a movie. Yeah. I mean, for me, I enjoyed the fact that it went linear, the way that you presented it. Because right. you could have jumbled it up too. Uh, just, I just, I, yeah. I didn't, I didn't care. Yeah. But I think it's nice to see the evolution of your look. I mean, just <laughs> the way that you look from the very beginning. You know, you you look like a sixties hippie. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, I think we lost Sarah again. Crazy. I and oh then and then you know how you kind of go and you move through the seventies. And it's just nice to see how you change look wise and and you become more confident too. I think there's a confidence that comes forward because initially I, I mean I think you're a confident guy in general, but you didn't know if you could get away with some of the stuff at the beginning. But then I still don't know if I could get away with it. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I think hopefully Sarah will come back. I I would think that Sarah's internet connection would be the best of all of us because she's she's the techie. Here we right. go. All right, yay. Sarah, where Hi, Sarah. are you now? Are you in Brooklyn? You're in Brooklyn. Yeah, I don't know why my internet keeps cutting out. I've like never had this. You have Time Warner? Before. You have one of those companies as your internet yeah, provider? Verizon. Oh my God. My I, I have them too. I'm not that wild about them. Anyway, so they have that, not been doing well for me. That's okay. We we sorry. What did you say? We we've just been basically talking about how Joey's, Joey's, <laughs> Joey's look has changed. Yeah. That's why I like the linear way that they were presented. Uh -huh. So anyway, I, I was wondering if you. Had, oh, go, go ahead. On, sorry. Uh, no, you go. Oh, I was wondering if you had okay if you had a favorite prank that you pulled off because I thought they were all I so funny. Do. Thank you. They're, they're, I, I sort of explained it, they're like my children and you can't really pick a favorite. Some are more, mm -hmm. more successful than others. But when you, when you make it into the realm of being national or international news uh, and, and getting your message out there, they, uh, they all have a, 
a percentage of being successful. So and how I measure success is different than how most people measure success. I'm not measuring success by how much money I've made, but how many people I've reached. So what do you, so what do you measure success by then? It's, how wait, did you say it's, I'm, oh, got it. Sorry, I thought you said, okay, got it. I mean, what was, what's the most recent thing that you've been doing? Like, are you, are you still pranking people? Well, we've been concentrating on, on getting my archive together and getting a home for that, but there's always something in the works, you know, and if I tell you, I have to kill you. Okay. <laughs> Every April Fool's, there's a parade in New York City. Every uh, April Fool's Day. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I must tell you, though, when we, when we did Art of the Prank, Joey actually came. Joey was there. Joey was at our school. <laughs> Uh, that's we, not true. <laughs> we did prank, we pranked the audience. We had a Joey lookalike, one of his friends who was also a newspaper person or a writer. Anyway, I can't remember. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. he was dressed up with the beard. I have pictures. I can share them with you. And uh, he had Great. a hat, and he and he was Joey's it was Buck Wolf. It was Buck Wolf from from Huff Post. Right, right from the Huffington Post. That's right. Yeah. So. The pranks are always there. The idea is uh, when you least expect it, expect it. Right, Joey? Right, exactly. exactly. I had some questions for you, too. Um, just a few things that I, I wrote down in my notes. Um, do you think that something like Andres Serrano's um, Piss Christ somehow, you, you kind of predated that by a couple of, at least two or three decades? I mean, the, the cross that you had with Jesus and, and when you march them from 60, on 66, 67, 68, 69 on Easter, uh, that that kind of prefigures right. this re, re, uh, rethinking of religious ceremonies. I mean, I thought of, when I saw that again, because I didn't know about that initial um, performance that you created, and it reminded me of Andre Serrano's um, you know, where the ultra right just went crazy um, with, with this art that he created, which I think still is quite beautiful. I mean, you can look at it as something that's denigrating and blasphemous, but it's, it's still quite beautiful. And I, I felt the same way about your Christ figure um, that you carried around. Do you think that, I mean, do you think that that has any resonance? I, what about Scorsese's prank, right? You've seen the uh, movie on the Rolling Thunder Review, oh. where everything is kind of, yes. it, it reminded me of Joey Skaggs. Yeah. I think Scorsese's ripping off Joey Maybe. Skaggs. So. Well, I don't know. I wouldn't say ripping off. I would say maybe they've been influenced somewhat. Paying which homage. Is, which always. Paying yeah. homage. Well, I don't know if they, I don't think they don't pay the homage, but they, <laughs> they may have been influenced. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't know where yeah. that, well, came, yeah. where would it come from? It didn't seem like something Scorsese would do. Maybe Dylan encouraged him to do it. Who knows? Yeah, well, I know a number of people who are in that film, who are personal friends, and including people who have been in my performances. Uh, so I, I have no idea. I wasn't I mean, privileged I, to be part of that conversation. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's probably my favorite Dylan tour, too, at least the first part of it. Yeah. Um, but uh, Sarah, I don't yeah, mean to hog exactly. the questions. Maybe. Oh no, it's fine. I one one thing when I was watching the film was that it struck me like once. Uh oh. <laughs> you froze, Sarah. Sarah. Oh, Sarah. That's Sarah a has to pay that utility bill. That's the Dylan song. On Desire too, actually. <laughs> <laughs> She'll come back. This is going to be an interesting interview. Well, you know, the, the, the technological issues we had for the Zoom so far, we've been pretty good. We we had one fellow who was in California for the uh, documentary that we did about underground rock performers from the '90s. That one guy kept flipping in and out as well because he was in the mountains. So so far. Hey. We have to make do with what we have. Yeah. Um, I, some of my other questions, I guess I can, the choice of music. How did you guys come up with some of the choices of music? 
Uh, do you perform them? Oh, oh well, I'm so glad you asked that. Uh, many years ago, I was tracked down by a young composer. His name is Daniel Pemberton, and he was do at the time he was doing um, video games, but he was 17. He's British, lived in London. He came to my studio. He came he wanted, to New York. He wanted to talk with me, and, and he credits me with influencing him. He had so. <laughs> read about Joey, and he, it was like Joey was his idol, and he wanted, I guess. I That's know. wonderful. And today, he to meet him. And today, he is a world renowned uh, composer. Movie composer. Yeah, he sounds and really he's up for familiar. an Academy Award. Yeah. 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 He, he did, he's done really a lot of movies lately. It's so many, it's hard to count. But so he's let it, he, he gave us access to his music, which was great. And, and we, we... We supplemented. Yeah. And, and then there was a question filling out these applications for film festivals, like, how much money did you spend on the budget? <laughs> and we looked at each other, budget? <laughs> we're, shooting you, we're shooting the movie on the cell phone out of our dining room window. You know, what, what, what budget? We, you know, so we had to buy some music. It was $20, but we got a $4 discount. So it was $16. So we put down $16 for the budget. <laughs> That's what we love. That's what we sense. love. When we have a group of, you know, the way the festival works is that we have a, a two-tiered judging process. And we ha I have a group of students that are interns that are doing it for credit and they evaluate all the films that, we, that are submitted to us. They're broken up into groups. Although we can't really do it that way now. So I send them the links, they watch, they fill out a Google document rating the films. And um, you know, basically they help us weed down the large amount of entries that we get. And then the films that they push to the right. next round are watched by a another group of um, evaluators, people like Sarah and previous winners, uh, members of the press and academics. And then they're the ones that, um, you know, choose the films that we have. And what I say to them at the very beginning to both groups is that money should not be, you shouldn't judge the film just on production values. It really should be right. on, on the, the story or the content. Um, exactly and, right. And I think that's why your film is in. <laughs> well, no, the fact that the money doesn't matter, it's the content that's important, right? It's story, exactly right. Yeah, exactly. So I had a few other questions. Um, uh, choice of, the actual performance documentation was done by whom? In other words, when you're setting up people coming to, you know, there's definitely the the news stuff that you have, you know, the ABC News, and but who is documenting you actually putting on the prank or the performance besides I, the I, people? I, I, I solicit friends to be my documentarians. I, I try to make sure I have it covered, both either video, film, uh, stills, recording, I, I try to make sure that I have possession of the material because I have learned horrible lessons by not being in control. Possession and that, is everything. And, and that's, you must have like a ton of stuff. Uh, you must have a warehouse full of, of recordings. And a lot of them look like they're on- I do. A lot of them look like they're on videotape, so that precipitates the need to preserve the material before it deteriorates. Absolutely, absolutely right. And, and that, is, that is a major challenge. We now have to find a way of trans, transposing and digitizing uh, all of what we have to, to preserve it, which is why I was looking for an archive uh, to begin with. Yeah. And it makes perfect I'm sense. Still it makes perfect sense for NYU to do it since that's your home base. Well, one, one of the problems is with NYU is I'm a painter, I'm a sculptor, I'm a filmmaker, I'm a photographer, you know, I, I'm all of those things. Yeah. And what do you do with all of that? I've, I've built many objects from the confessional booth to yeah, the, yeah. the Trump, you know, golden shower uh, outhouse <laughs> to, you know, the White House to what, you know, whatever. <laughs> the rocket. The, the rocket. Yeah, yeah, the rocket. So, the rocket and, and the... And I can't... The I Trump... can't dump all of this on... on one, yeah. Sorry. Right. 
So where, where, NYU do you can, all, where do you put all that stuff, Joey? I I have um, where buildings. Are yeah. Crazy. It is crazy. Yeah, yeah. Thank, oh, Sarah's back. Yay, Sarah. <laughs> I tried. I restarted my computer. All right. That's probably the best thing. <laughs> yeah. So we've just been chatting about, you know, um, who did the music. It turns out that there's uh, a Mr. Pemberton, who's a very famous composer for uh, ho Hollywood pictures and, and the like, who uh, provided the music, uh, or at least yeah. gave Some you guys. Of, yeah. not, not, not all of it, but, of but, it. but a good part of it. Yeah. And so yeah. we talked about the music. We talked also a little bit about um, uh, documentation. None of this, none of my work would be, none, none of my work would be possible without the, contribu the contributions of friends. So I, I mean, you must, really have an amazing, to... you must have an amazing network, Joey. I, I, well, you know, one of the sad things is viewing my, my work, going over it, I'm going, they're no longer with us. They're, he's no longer, she's no longer, you know, the, you know so many people have passed. You know, I've been doing this for, for decades and not everyone is still around and it's painful to, to see them. At least I have them on, on film or on video, but um, I'm always looking to expand my, my, my base of talent, the new, new people. And I'm fortunate to be able to continually do that. I think I think my favorite story, and I'm sorry, Sarah, if you want to jump in, jump in any time. But is Vern Williams still alive? No, he's not. Let's see, um, no. that, that was one of my favorite ones of the four that you submitted. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Thank you. The question that I was going to ask before my computer died was, um, like, what do you think it says about the news media that they fall for this? Like, because because it seemed like once you got like one bit of press, it snowballed and everyone else was like, oh, cool. There's like a, like a cat, wait, it was like the prostitution house for dogs. And then it must be real because it was in this like news article. So then everybody started writing about it. And it just, it just maybe, like to me it showed how gullible people are, but I didn't know if that's what you took away from it. Well, Sarah, I, I think uh, President Donald Trump learned from my work. <laughs> yeah, you're right. And I don't think I don't think the, the population has. You're right. Well, that that's the most interesting part is that even when the news media knows it's been pranked, right? They still they still make it like it's your fault, not their fault that they felt. <laughs> You know what I mean? It's really uh, right. it's absolutely ridiculous right. that they, they, they have these retractions, but it's almost an indictment of you for coming up with the prank. You know, it's... it's it, One it's of my crazy. favorite retractions was from UPI. I did, I did the cockroach vitamin pill hoax, where right? I pretended I was a world famous entomologist with a PhD from the University of Columbia in Bogota. And then I had developed a super strain of cockroach that I'd been feeding toxins to, and the roaches developed immunities, and I extracted their hormones, and I made a vitamin pill which cures arthritis, acne, anemia, and menstrual cramps, and I offered it to, to the public. And I had a press conference, and numerous journalists came, including a representative of United Press International, and they ran the story syndicated around the country, around the world. Roach hormone hailed as miracle drug. <laughs> so when it was revealed that it was a hoax, the head of the news division, UPI, said, it was correct at the time. And that's how they justified it. Jesus. It was correct at the time. You, you'd think they would have fact checkers, you know? Oh, they do. They, they do. They do. <laughs> Not good ones. <laughs> Not good ones. And it's worse and worse, you know. The, the press now is just, they're ghost ships, you know. There's like newspaper reporters. It's, or, it's, 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 it's very a terrible. Sad thing what's happened. I think Trump has destroyed the media. They've, they've, they've added to their own self-destruction. But, but now, I think we've had trouble with Art of the Prank because I think the media is, has always been threatened by my commentary. They are even more threatened by, by my commentary now because they're fighting their credibility every day with Donald Trump saying fake news every day. Right. They don't want to focus on their, their foibles, on their inadequacies, or 
their blatant mistakes or their irresponsibility. They don't want to examine themselves and, and take issue to correct their sloppy reporting. Right. They would rather the point of finger. It's very true. And that's one, one of the things that's so exacerbating because now it's gotten worse. Uh, you know, I love certain characters on TV. I feel like they're decent people. I know people that know them without naming sure. names. But they're just basically right. reading, they're reading newspaper entrees, and I, I can do that myself. I, there's nobody on the ground doing the legwork anymore. And right. with the pandemic, okay, it makes it very difficult. But still, uh, even without the pandemic, they weren't doing the legwork necessary. Right. But is that just because their budgets were cut so much? Or... No. no. The, the reasons are the same. They want to get it first. They want to be fast. It, it's basically a profit making business the bottom line is making money they want to they want to keep their advertisers not lose their advertisers yeah. they want to keep their audience they don't want their audience to lose faith in their confidence that what they're reporting isn't true if you destroy their credibility as an investigative news source then they're devalued and they're just information so so they don't want to focus on their problems what infotainment infotainment <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. But I had a, a related question to what Sarah said, you know, the the folks from Channel 7 that said they would never have you on their programs anymore. Did they, <laughs> did they ever find out that, you know, that uh, Joey Bone is not the guy, but did they ever oh. unknowingly take you no, off I, then? I, I, I love that comment. She was so full of herself. She, you know, Take a look at his face. It's the last time you'll see this man on this. Network. And then you were on next week. And of course, week. numerous times. I mean, numerous times. <laughs> well, we're we're kind of winding down our Q and A, but I wanted you guys to tell tell our audience what they're going to be seeing in the in in, in your film. I mean, maybe kind of give an overview of what they're going to be seeing. Go ahead, Jude. Okay, so this is. Uh, a series of episodes of oral histories of Joey telling stories. Stand Basically, alone. there's four episodes. At the beginning, he gives a lot of backstory. He, he talks about his, his upbringing and what led him to, uh, to the life that he has led. And the second one is more about what happened in the 60s and 70s, living in New York and working in New York with his work developing and blossoming. And then it's followed by two stories. One is the bad guy's talent management agency, where Joey tried to get, he, he, his friend wanted to be an actor. Don't give it away. And Joey decided to create an agency. So it's very awkward. And then the thir fourth one is called The Fat Squad. And I'm gonna leave it at that and let people watch because <laughs> I think it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Well, well folks. And it's only the beginning. It's only the beginning. The tip of the iceberg. We're going to get more of these. But we're here at the New Jersey Film Festival. We're big fans of Joey Skaggs' art. And whenever he has something, we're, we're always very proud to show it off to the world thank and to our community. And, you know, I want to thank you guys for looking to us first as, as, as a place to be a clearinghouse for your, for your work. Thank Sarah, you so much. Thank for you. Your oh, you guys thank are great. You, Sarah, do you have any parting comments or observations or questions? No, Sarah. Um, no, I, I'm <laughs> looking forward to seeing the original film after uh, watching the, the oral histories. Great, 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 yeah. great. Thank you. Looking now, forward now, to now folks, yours. what I wanted to just reiterate that this film is going to be playing on Friday, February 12th. There's video on demand for 24 hours. You can get information at our website, which is njfilmfest.com. I think you guys can read that, njfilmfest.com. That's one of our lawn signs that we put out uh, steering people to our space. But since we're doing everything virtually, they're now in my home. And so we use them as a backdrop so you know that we'll be uh, you know, available at njfilmfest.com, which you click on schedule for the spring 2021 New Jersey Film Festival. And then you'll have to click another link uh, when you get to that page to get to our uh, eventive website, which has a catalog of everything we're showing, the schedule. You can buy passes. Each film program is $12. You can buy a pass for the entire festival for $100. Um, we took really quite a beating this past year. 
Uh, we were able to make some of the money up because we did pretty well in the fall with our virtual festival, but we've lost two major sponsors um, for a variety of reasons because of the pandemic. And so now we're, you know, scrambling to make up the shortfall, but this is the way it is to run a nonprofit arts uh, group like I am. And so folks, if you're interested, make sure you circle February 12th on your calendar because you don't want to miss uh, Joey Skaggs, the great Joey Skaggs, talking about his wonderful art and performances. So um, thanks so much, guys, for being part of this Q&A. And uh, I, I want to thank Sarah, Joey, and Judy for doing this. And um, make sure you check out the movies and see you at the screenings. All right, let's just do this.